And there's the blue lights. This is the Nilva Nexus, a weekly Torah hangout for the common man. Uh, James the Idol Smasher. Uh, with this is uh, Ross and Rosalie, and we might get some folks in here. We might not. Again, Jews are on holiday. It's Simcha Torah, which is uh, the second celebration, or maybe the first, if you want to look at it, first the year of, of the giving of the Torah. Um, uh, on uh, on on uh, this one, we dance. The first one, we it's you stay up all night and you study, and then this one, you dance. So we probably got some. Jewish folk out there boogieing. I don't know if they'll be able to join us. Um, but uh, we're here, and we are live. And we've entered into uh, Bere Sheet, which, I, I, as I said in, in, the, in, the, in the description of the, of the Hangout, it's, I think it's one of the most perplexing, complex, and mind-blowing, and informative, just... One of the, the if there's a, if there's a parsha of the Torah that I would say is my favorite, it's this one. Uh, Noah's pretty good too, but this one, there's so much to it. It tells so much of, of human history. Um, I know we like talking about the the Garden of Eden in the seven days, but I'm kind of more curious on chapter four and five uh, this year. You know that might be something to look at here. So that's our parsha of the week, and because we're starting our reading cycle over. And uh, also, topic of the day is holding a grudge, because that's a, um, a common human frailty. I'm guilty of it myself, um, but it's detrimental um, to just about everything. Um, again, might even might even go way of, of idolatry. You know, they say that anger is idolatry. When you get raving mad and you're angry that the world isn't working out, you're actually saying, God, this isn't good enough. What this is is not, this isn't the way it's supposed to be, God, you're wrong. So it's kind of an idolatry issue with, with and I think holding a grudge might be there too. Something to discuss. Ah. Now, some folks are concerned because I might side on the Gare side more than the Nohri side of the Noah Hyde, Ben Noah folk um, that we're not out celebrating right now. And if I'm supposed to be a gear, I'm supposed to behave like a Jew. And we haven't gotten quite there yet. Uh, so to those who might have issue, you know, we're here to discuss anything, especially what's going on right now in Israel. We are not in Israel. So we do the best we can and, and we, uh, we gather together and, and we talk. I've never been personally. I've never been really as concerned with any holy day or festival, for that matter, like I have been with Shabbat. That one's the one that seems to stick with me. That's the one that appeals to, I think, the Universal Torah. Um, possibly Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, um, definitely because it's celebrating the birth of the human soul of the human soul. But uh, um, as far as putting into my life that's always been there the, the rhythm of it i've always i've always been more concerned with shabbat so you know maybe this year when i up my game maybe we can maybe we can start incorporating more uh holiday time we'll see how it goes to new year and we'll do the best we can uh this year I'm, i've decided i'm going to pick up because we went through the stones for a couple of years now and this year, I'm going to start looking into the Gutnik edition Kumash, which some might refer to as the Kabad Bible. Um, it's not really it's the Kabad Bible, but it's what they use. It's the, you know, the, 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 the teaching. And there's a lot of goodies that go along with every, every uh, chapter in this book, every page. There's a lot of goodies. It's not straight scripture. There's a lot of commentary and uh, little bits at the bottom that say sparks of Chesidus. So, anyway, how y'all doing tonight? I guess everyone's doing well. Okay. <laughs> yep, I'm good. I'm good. You know, I was I was uh, you know reading uh, 
some blogs from Rabbi Chlorphine, and, and um, he's got a um, video. If you type in, um, I think it's been Noah. Um, in YouTube, the first video that pops up is Chlorphine um, at Nativ down there in Houston. And he, he gave a, a lecture on on, the, on what you might call the Ger Shabbat, the Noahide Shabbat, whatever. I don't remember exactly how it was referred to, but he, he it's a great video. And in there, he was talking about, you know, Shem, the Ben Noach of Ben Noachs. Okay, um, this is the this is this is the the first priest we get in the Torah. Shem is um, the first person he set up a yeshiva. A university for Torah study, and um, he was saying how much more powerful Shem was. What a, a powerful human being to be on the earth at the time when he opened the yeshiva, the yeshiva of Shem and Eber, because he came from a humanity prior to the flood. And one of the things he brings up are the ages of the offspring of Adam. Um, 930 years, we've got 912 years, 950 years, 910 years. Um, these people lived a nice, long life. Having kids the whole time, I um, These were not the human beings we know of today. And the, the power that Shem, like Noah, Noah came from that, Shem came from that world as well. And was a very powerful man on the earth. Um, probably one of the more underrated folks, I think, in modern Torah discussion with, with non-Jews is Shem. And um, so that's all. Also, blasphemy was a topic in one of the groups I'm in. I think it was the great debate. We were talking blasphemy, and one guy was just raving against the the Noahide code because he, he hates blasphemy laws. And he, you know, a lot of the things he gets out of blasphemy laws is if you question the Bible, you're a blasphemer. You get fingers pointed at you and everyone yells at you, you know. And when you're in religion, it's like that. Um, or, or, or how it is, you know, in parts of Islam, if you, if you blaspheme, they'll kill you right then and there. No, no two ways about it. Um, but I noticed at the end of like, chapter four, and I just shut my, my screen down. Hang on, let me back it up here. I noticed at the end of chapter four, <coughs> uh, right before six, which is or right before five, we get the genealogy, and then six is at the end of our parshas when we see thing we see human humanity go wrong, and it was um, after the birth of Shem, for God has given. Has given Shas me another seed instead of Havel and Cain, for Cain killed him. Um, Seth or Shas uh, also fathered a son, and he was named Enosh. Then God's name became profaned by people calling humans and idols by the name of God. So it all began with blasphemy. the The road to hell, if you will, the road that brought in the flood. I would think started with blasphemy. You start calling the name of God. You start. I, mean, I guess it could be idolatry. Maybe it is idolatry. I was thinking humans, because they were uh, in the the stone edition. Says, and this is when people became began calling upon the name of God. And the Gutnik here, they kind of give a parenthesis. Then God's name became profaned by people calling humans and idols by the name of God. In the Stone Edition, it reads, um, hang on a minute. Uh, then to call in the name of Hashem became profane. Then to call in the name of Hashem became profane. So I think that would be blasphemy. It sounds like blasphemy in the Stone Edition. Uh, the Gutnik, it sounds more like idolatry. Something I thought that was interesting. This means that all these people here that have been living on the earth at that time knew God's name 
and could crawl on it for, for better or for worse. Apparently, it went worse. People ask us why, you know, I always hyphenate God. I don't always, when I hyphenate God or when I say Hashem. Uh, people, Christians, love to get on me for that one. Why aren't you saying his name? Why don't you say the mighty and they'll say the the Yav or Yahu, you know, whatever, the or the witnesses, the J witnesses. They want to say these names. I say it by this name. One guy was bragging to me. When, when I talk about God, I say it by his real name. And then he spells out the capital Roman New or the YHVH and then he tries to say it, pronounce it, even though that's not how we pronounce it. I've seen it written out before, and that's not. There are far more syllables in that name than just, you know, if I remember correctly, I could be wrong, because I don't call on the name of God. Because you know, we can see we can see the result of that in Genesis. That's like, this is the one part of the Torah that we're allowed to actually look at, and no one's going to gripe at you for it out there in the world. The, the no-no hides aren't going to gripe at you for looking at everything that happened up to Genesis 9. This is a big one. So is, this one's a doozy. And the wife and kids are gone, so I have a cat that's freely roaming around talking to me. For the past half hour, she's been nothing but talk, so you might hear a long, loud, pathetic meow. My lovely feline. I personally think critters should be out in the world, free. But the wife and kids want to have one inside, so I got a critter. She loves to talk. She's definitely in the right household for talking. <laughs> All right, well, I want to read out of the Gutnik condition real quick here. This is um, a question on verse 26, uh, 426, which is, how did people come to worship idols? Um, and it gives uh, the Rambam. In the days of Enosh, people made a serious mistake in the council of the wise, and the council of the wise people degenerated into foolishness. Their mistaken reasoning was that since God created the skies and spheres as part of nature and placed them on high, giving them dignity, and since they, the skies and spheres, are servants, uh, who, ser or servants who serve Hashem, it would be appropriate to laud, glorify, and honor them. They argued that it is the will of the Almighty for man to make a great and to dignify those who make God great to honor him in the same way that a king wants to honor the servants who serve him. Such is the honor of a king. This is the fundamental basis of idolatry. However, they did not deny the existence of God by saying that only such and such star exists. After some time, prophets of falsehood arose and said that the Almighty had commanded them to serve such and such a star, to bring sacrifices to it, to offer libations to it, and to build a temple containing its form, in order that all the people, including women, children, and the ignoramus, will be able to bow down to it. Each of these prophets may known a form which he had invented himself, and claimed that it was a form of such and such a star which had been no made known to him in a prophecy. In this manner, people started to make figures in the temples, under trees, and on the tops of mountains and hills, and they congregated and bowed down to them. Prophets, the prophets said that it was a, it was a form which brought food and, uh, good and evil, and that it was fitting to serve and fear it. Prophets said that through the service, one would multiply and be successful and issued instructions concerning what may and may not be done. Other prophets of falsehood began to make themselves known and said that the star itself or sphere or angel had spoken to him about how to be served. Stop on my chair, critter. Um, pardon. Uh, we said that the star or the angel had spoken them personally how to be served and what may or may not be done. This matter, namely the worship of forms in different manners, the offering of sacrifices to them, and bowing down to them became propagated throughout the entire world. Due to the passage of time, the honored and fear-inducing name was forgotten by all of nature. It was not recognized. Everybody, women and children included, knew only the forms of wood and stone. 
in the temples of stone to which from childhood they had been educated to bow down and worship and take in the name and take the name uh take the name of for oaths the wise people among them such as the priests imagined that there was no god but only the stars and spheres because of which they made representative figures but as for the creator there was not a single person who recognized him except for various individuals such as uh Hanoch, Methuselah, Noach, Shem, and Aver. Things continued in this manner until Avraham Avinu, pillar of the world, was born. And that's from the beginning of the laws of idol worship from the Rambam. Discuss. That's, I think it's like, I think that's relevant now. Yes. I'm pretty similar to what we see today. Okay. I think, you know, go ahead. I look Please. at you, ivory, wood, stone, and brick and mortar buildings, a needle to that, and how to this. I'm pretty familiar. See, it's the, it's the, um, it's the first step of atheism. Uh, I said, I said the wise people among them, such as the priests, imagined that there was no God, but only the stars and spheres because of which they, because of which they made representative figures. And, and, and a good bunch of atheist folk, not everybody, of course, I, I'm no better, I know better than that, but a lot of atheist folk um, are heavy on the scientism. The material is all that is. Kind of have to wonder sometimes about the mentality of certain people. Can't see it, <clears throat> it doesn't exist, or not real or you know but it's it kind of to me in a way is I've, I've heard an explanation that people in medieval times felt like or the, the thought was that your eyes generated the light that allowed you to see whatever it was you were looking at and I'm wondering how on earth could anyone entertain that idea? Why would they light a candle if they needed to see something? They could just use their eyes to generate the load. I don't think that's a plausible explanation. I've heard it. I cannot believe that anybody actually believed that. six-year-old to figure that out <laughs> one thing that tripped up uh, some of the atheist folks I was talking to um, is a Gerald Schroeder video he's showing you the the cone uh, where it starts from dot and it shows the universe expands it's like a diagram and it's the superheated period and then the cooling and then the galaxies form and all this it's like a table you can see it at NASA and um, at the beginning there, you've got the, the bang, if you will, and then right next to it, you have what's called quantum fluctuations, which doesn't mean a darn thing. We know the quantum fluctuations made this happen. What, what, what do you mean quantum? Well, something fluctuated on the quantum level. Okay. Gerald Schroeder um, mentioned a guy, Ed Schreier, I think was his name. And he, and in the journal Science, he wrote an article that said that it is absolutely possible to have ex nihilo, uh, nothing created or something created from nothing, provided that the forces of nature existed prior to the Big Bang. So the forces of nature, the the super, or the, the the electromagnetic force, the weak force, the strong force, and and the gravitational force, um, or at least that's what we label them by. 
Um, it was thought to be one unified force at the beginning, predates the universe, isn't physical, acts upon the physical. They they, they act upon the physical every 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 millisecond. Um, And, and, and that's pretty much what would have caused, if the, if the forces of nature existed prior to the, the bang, then that's basically the biblical definition of God. The only definition of, the only name of God spoken in Genesis 1 is, he, is Elohim. God is active in the universe. Um, you can't see it. It has no physical form, but acts upon the physical and predates the universe. Bada boom. Creates the universe out of nothing. That's the biblical definition of God. Science actually discovered God. And that trips folks up too, because those forces are applicable throughout the universe. They're the same everywhere, you know, as far as we can tell. And it, it trips them up. They're used to a guy in a beard. They're used to having, you know, this uh, God idol, whatever they have on a shelf with all the others all the other idols and it's the same thing but you know <laughs> it tripped a few people up they did not like that at all <laughs> makes perfect sense too biblically it makes perfect sense anyway i digress i'm digressing just briefly on that what you can't see acting or exerting force on the physical mm -hmm. a pretty good example of that is the air that we breathe you can't actually see it i mean if there's smoke or fog yeah okay but it's there all the time constantly around there's 14.5 pounds of pressure <clears throat> on every square inch of the human body <clears throat> by the atmosphere and then one would ask well what keeps the atmosphere here what you know why doesn't it just blow away and then they'll say gravity gravity pulls it down but that's not true there is no such pulling space is pushing on this planet pushes the atmosphere against the planet. <laughs> a lot of people aren't aware of that. <laughs> you can't see space. You can fly through space. You no gravity in space, but it's keeping our atmosphere here. <laughs> mind blowing. Well, yeah. Somewhere in the Torah it says that God fixed the earth in heaven and earth. And people seem to look at that as geocentricism, which is fine, in my opinion. Um, but the earth is very fixed. It's very, it's very set. If, if it wasn't set, you know, it, it would fly off in the, in, the, in the cosmos. And like you were saying, that's where the whole dark matter thing is coming into play. Because, yeah, it should be a very dense atmosphere, and it's not. Yet there's a force that creates the sphere. Bubbles is another prime example of it, you know. The, the earth isn't round, all the water on it's, you know, being, it, you know, most of the earth is in earth, it's water. If you took all the water off of the earth, it would not be spherical. <laughs> Rock, but you put the, you know. There's a police car in the background, they're coming to take me away, ha <laughs> <laughs> Busted. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, a lot of that is matter itself is according to Einstein's formula E equals MC square. If you take the energy itself it starts from matter that's been accelerated twice the speed of light. If you take matter and accelerate it, it becomes energy. Conversely, if you slow the 
slow it down, then that energy becomes mass. But they say that Holes heard this too. Energy cannot be destroyed, it can only be transformed. That's part of what his theory goes to prove. for a second. You're home alone. I'm surprised you're not rigging the place up. Oh, a little bit. Kind of, uh, boring and quiet. <laughs> you're kitty, 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 kitty. <laughs> Let me shut the door. It's hot in here. Well, open it. Oh, it's open. Turn the paint on. Preoccupied somewhere. We found this too. If you have a cat that's, uh, if you have a cat and he likes to claw and scratch on stuff like uh, ours does, this is a little something I have just to pass along. Scratching deterrent spray. It's got a lot of citrus in here, and apparently cats hate citrus. So. She loved the uh, the box spring of all our mattresses. That was her favorite place to go and just tear up. And you can smack her with a towel. You can throw her. You can put her outside. It didn't stop her. Spray a little bit of this around the bed. No problem. She goes up and started clawing and, and took it and then put set back up and then just walked away real disgusted. So this this stuff does work. Scratching the turns. Yeah, yeah. I think tomorrow <clears throat> is the reading of the last parsha of Bezos America. And then Shabbat is actually the beginning of Breshi. I've heard you're supposed to read them back to back. And the ending rooted in the beginning. The circle continues. There's no breakage. One hand, if you kind of think about that a certain way, it's like you're in a loop. <laughs> you just keep going around in circles. Yeah. The ultimate and left turns. Okay. Say what? The ultimate in left terms. Hmm. Hi, Vanessa. Vanessa. Hi. You made it after all. Well, I'm just popping in for a minute. Um, we've been dancing with the tour like crazy, and I needed a hair tie, so I thought I'd say hi. <laughs> hi. Hello. <laughs> what I say? Everybody's out getting down. As I was saying earlier when I hear it, you know, it's Simcha Torah, so all the Jews are dancing probably right now. They're all getting down. Yeah, I know. I get to hold the Torah and dance with it. Cool. Yeah. Cool. We were talking Genesis. Genesis. Are you? And, um... The weekly cycle, how or the annual cycle, how it's we end it and start it over at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, <coughs> I think one of the more powerful stories. There's a midrash that uh, Moses didn't want to go, and not because he wanted to hang on to his position or he wanted to continue. You know, the task wasn't completed. You know. Israel hadn't gotten there yet. They're just crossing over the Jordan. 
He knew he couldn't see it, and he prayed and prayed and prayed to God, and he prayed to the point where the gates of heaven were shaking. His prayer was so hard. He, he, and, and it says if, he, if, he, if God let him pray once more, the gates of heaven would have, would have fallen, and he would have been forced to give Moses what he wanted, and that's when God took him. I used to cry when I when I read that. <laughs> Five hundred and fifteen times he prayed. How many? The story I always heard was he prayed five hundred and fifteen times to be let into the land. I've never heard that one. I heard about if Noah prayed that you could have saved the whole world from the flood. Really? If yes. Noah prayed what? If Noah had prayed, actually spoken up on the behalf of the people, um, God would have not even sent the flood. But he didn't. That's always a possibility, but I never quite saw it that way. Um, it, it's actually in Rebbe Nachman's writings. See, I heard that one too. I didn't hear the one that James and Ross had heard, but I heard the one that you just said. Yeah. He didn't pray till after the flood, did he? Didn't he? Who, Noah? Yeah. No, he didn't do anything until afterwards. Okay, yeah. There's a saying that um, Noah made wine and Abraham made men. <laughs> All he would have had to do was pray. Wow. Mm -hmm. Considering everybody was blaspheming at the time, I guess it was best to remain silent. I've always wondered that because people, you know, didn't he try to get people on the ark? Wasn't he proselytizing? And I have a very cynical base. I try to overcome this, you know. But I might, I could understand the cynical Noah that said, "Let him drown," you know, because part of me sees that. I looked around. I'm like, oh, "What's the point?" Of I know yeah. better. And I have to pull myself out of it every time, but you know, I still have this well, bottom ground. I, I relate to him, but I also understand from the story that Noah had the opportunity to be the first forefather of Judaism and he passed it up. He mm. didn't go out and try to, you know, change anybody. He just built the ark and said, let them all drown. I'll give you more perspective if I may. Go ahead. You're, you're minding your own business, living your life, and then one day, God comes up and says, the end of all flesh has come before me. I am no longer going to tolerate this. Noah, build an ark. You, I'm like, I would say, but, but, Build an ark. The end of all flesh has come before me. At this point, how long do you really want to argue? I mean, I, to me, if, if that were the if it had been me, I'm like, his mind's made up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I don't know. What am I supposed to do to talk him out of it? You know? Obviously, he's thought about this, and he's made a decision, so where's the hammer and nails? That's my take. Well, that just shows you how much more of a special man that Avraham was. He could bargain with God. You know, he felt comfortable enough to do so. You know, I think I think you know Moses might have been another one. You know, when when something would happen, they would intervene. They would, you know, on behalf of the people or on behalf of Lot and his family, Abraham would speak up. But 
That um. Then again, it's real easy to say that after a covenant was already made that he would destroy the earth again you know, with the flood. So, <laughs> okay, maybe now that I'm talking out loud, it's all making sense. Yeah. Well, we could talk about we could relate the intervening part to you know to Sukkot itself because the Jews offered a, a sacrifice on the behalf of the nations. Every one of the nations, every one of the seventy nations, they had a sacrifice for so that they could receive atonement. So even even as long as the temple Hamidash is built, you know, and it continues today, the Jews do prayer, uh, do tefillah prayer instead. They pray on the behalf of the nations. They intercede on their behalf. And so that's part of Ezra's job is, as part of their commitment to be a part of the light of the nations is that the, they, they intercede on our behalf. And so that we don't receive such a harsh judgment. Don't see that much happening today. Yeah, I, I thank you, Israel, <laughs> for doing that. I know you're commanded, but thank you anyway. Hope I'm worthy of your prayer. Hope we all will be one day. What she was just saying about the Torah being offered to the whole world that is in this uh, Parsha visit. First couple of verses, it's um, summarized, but uh, the gist of it is that the Torah was offered to Esau, and then it went back and it's uh, where, it, where he came from, Paran, that is saying that the uh, Torah was offered to <laughs> Ishmael, Isaac's bro uh, brother, half brother, whatever. So uh, they had a chance to accept Torah, but those rejections meant that it had to go from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob because Ishmael and Esau rejected it. So we don't know a lot about Shem, I guess. Um, obviously, well, maybe not obviously. Okay, one could say possibly that he made up for his father's shortcomings. Certainly he and Japheth covering his father um, showed a bit of responsibility. But we have the first priest I mean, he didn't wait till a descendant of Abraham to give the world a priest or a yeshiva. I'm just seeing a lot of love there. <laughs> I'm seeing a lot of love. But I, I mean, you got to rebuild the world, you know, and he rebuilt it with, with God in mind, or he was rebuilding it with God in mind. Oh, are you talking about Shem himself? Yeah. Um, you know, he wasn't. I mean, he could have been the Noah had the chance to be the progenitor of, or the 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 the, the first patriarch. Is that what I'm hearing, Hadassa? He had the opportunity to be the first patriarch, and uh, he didn't take it. And I just wonder if Shem wanted to improve on that. I mean, for a person to be to open a yeshiva, for to become the first priest, um, it's almost like making up for being a patriarch, you know. Not that you're held to your father's sins, but if you can do better than he, or and, and that's not to put a father down. I'm not dishonoring a father by saying that, or my own father, for that matter. But no, I didn't set up a yeshiva. You know, which would have had us, which would have been in a tent, you know, it, you know, for mankind. He didn't do that. His son did. 
Shem did, but you have to remember too that contemporary with Shem was Nimrod, the descendant of Ham um, or Canaan, but Nimrod was actually the one that was contemporary with Shem during his lifetime and he was out trying to build this tower of babel shem is over here <clears throat> with his tents trying to teach the torah true torah and uh there's a contrast there it, it you you have to look uh, nimrod went out and built several cities uh he, nineveh was one of the cities that he built really yeah I didn't um, know that. Yeah, Nineveh. It was part of a. Nineveh was the main city, and then there were two, like, two or three suburbs. Anyway, it was it was a conglomeration of cities, and Nimrod was the one who was responsible for building those. If you keep reading in uh, Genesis uh, ten or eleven, somewhere up in there, nine, ten, eleven, you'll see that Nimrod built those cities, and. Uh, when Jonah actually goes to uh, Nineveh, it tells you that it was the great city. It took you three days to walk across it. Well, that had uh, been, I guess, in existence since the time of Nimrod. And we know that Nimrod was all about idolatry, which is why Jonah was sent. One mess was to spread out and the other one was to gather. Well, New, uh, Babel was not actually the first cities, <clears throat> nor was Nineveh. <clears throat> Cain actually fled to a city, if you remember. Mm -hmm. And there were uh, descendants between Adam and Noah that actually lived in cities. So it's a basically a Canaanite bad habit that was held over after Noah. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah. Because Japheth, if you read about him, he settled the coastlands. And obviously you're going to have cities on the coast. Ham, his descendants, if you read them in the names, uh, Egypt was one of his descendants. Canaan was one of his descendants. Nimrod, who built several of the cities, uh, Lut, or Put, I'm sorry, several of Canaan, Canaan's children were actually nations, Egypt being one of the nations. And it, Babel tried to unify everybody and bring them into one form of idolatry. Um, Nineveh obviously fell into idolatry. And then in the land of Canaan, when Abraham shows up, uh, the seven Canaanite nations that are already there, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, whatever, aren't necessarily hostile to Abraham, but we don't have Hebrews just yet. I mean, the beginning is there between Abraham and Lot. Uh, but when, after Isaac and Jacob, of course, Jacob has his two children and everybody's living in Canaan, you've got this small group of God-fearers, family, if you will, and others. There are others there, believe me, because Jacob, uh, well, Abraham had a yeshiva, the 318 souls. Isaac, I'm not sure. 
Jacob, I know, had a yeshiva. He set it up at Shechem, the same place that Abraham had a yeshiva. Uh, Jacob had actually bought that piece of land for 100 pieces of money just outside of Shechem. But the, the, the situation is that all of the Canaanite individuals uh, were dominant in the area at the time that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were all getting started. Uh, they went into captivity in Egypt, a descendant of, of Canaan. And then when they came out of Egypt, they went back to the land of Canaan, and there were the seven Canaanite nations still occupying the land of Canaan, all descendants of Canaan, Ham. It's just always uh, the servant of servants that, that Canaan was cursed, spent all of his time trying to keep Shem's descendants in captivity. Are you seeing this? Yes. Abraham actually bought Machpelah from a Hittite. Right. And then, of course, Hagar had the Egyptian maid. Ham's got you surrounded, or Canaan anyway. Yes, he does. A matter of fact, um, Nimrod, Babel, uh, Nineveh, and so forth, uh, those were actually the roots of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who came along later. So there you have Babylon, one of the first exiles, or captivities, if you will. Yep. And then I think subsequent who what the second well Sennacherib, I think was the first, the Syrian, who were descendants of Cain, Canaan, Babylon, and then now Greece and Rome, you might find some arguments, but if I'm not mistaken, Greece and Rome came about uh, being descendants of Japheth. The, uh, are the Greeks, um, Esau as well, Edom? Are, are the Greeks considered Edom then? We know the Romans are Edom. No, this is, this is pre-Abraham. Uh, All of what I'm saying here is pre-Abraham. Okay. Oh, I thought you said it was a... The, okay. By the time Abraham came along, you had the Hittites, Hivites, the Egyptians, the Babylonians. All of these characters were all over the map. It's just that they took turns... Uh, as history progressed, Sennacherib, the Syrian, then Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian. Uh, this this was after the first. First was Egypt, of course, where they were in slavery. That was never a captivity of slavery. Then after they came out, then got settled. As, as you've read, they were battling the Philistines even way back as far as the time of Samson and Deborah. The Philistines are descendants of Canaan. You know all this, I'm sure. Yes. I'm, I'm, I'm still kind of hung up on, on captivity. 
that's we, every that's that seems to be the enemy from Noah forward. Everything that when God says, "Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth," um, it says that to all creatures, great and small. Fill the earth, replenish it. And every example of a of a of a nasty bad civilization, from Babel to Egypt, um, it was all about captivity. Babylon as well, the 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 descendant of Babylon. You know, it was all about captivity. It was all about possession and, and control. So that that kind of tells you where God wants you. You know, right. It just didn't occur to me. I just never thought of Babel that way. And and what was the what was the king who got the uh, seven lambs at the well of Beersheba? Oh. Um, Abimelech and Abimelech. Pico. There, there was no captivity. There was um, there was an amicable relationship. No one had to possess the other. Mm. No? There was oppression. There were wars. Uh, different people clamoring for power, which, you know, Abraham at the time of Abimelech, Michael, and all that. Uh, Abraham's over, you know, like I said, he came from the Hittites, uh, Fikel, or Abimelech was an Egyptian, if I'm not mistaken. Then you have the place where Abraham came from, Chaldea, which is where they sent him back and found a wife for Isaac. And there, there was Laban, right? Even back then. So, right. But and, there, were, uh, there were, there were amic. If we're getting an example, there were amicable, amic, yeah, amicable relationships. There were, there were those who weren't always trying to place the the, the place the Shemite in captivity. If you want to look at it that way. At the this point, that became the case. In Egypt, that's where it shifted. Okay. Because uh, you remember the Pharaoh that rose up that did not know Joseph. Mm -hmm. and, and at that point, that's when the enslavement began to transpire and happen. It took place. They came out, of course, with all the riches into the land of Canaan. And if you remember back, Abraham, when he went down into Egypt and said, sister, uh, while he was there, Pharaoh or whoever was ruling at the time, was entertaining ideas of either adding Sarah to his harem or marrying her or whatever. Right. But then it was found out that she was actually Abraham's wife. He said, look, dude, you nearly caused me to sin big time. Take your wife and get out of here. And then when he sent uh, Abraham out of Egypt, and Lot was with him at the time, he gave him lots of cattle and uh, money. So Abraham went in poor and came out of Egypt rich, which was a precursor to what happened later in the Exodus. What do we know of Methuselah? I never really gave Methuselah too much thought. He was another name, um, part of the line that survived uh, through his his grandson, his son, um, through Noah. Okay. And then I watched the Noah film, 
which isn't all that bad. It certainly is the greatest feature film Hollywood's ever produced on Noah. That's only because it's the only one they've ever done. But they, but Methuselah was a, was a um, was a wise and powerful guy. Do we know anything about him? Are there any midrash on him? Has anybody, either of you guys, know much about this guy? Nothing except that he was old. Oh well, that's a help. Thanks, Rosalie. That you asked, I offered. <laughs> Go ahead, Rob. I was just saying he he was as far as I've always understood, he was the longest living human being uh, of, uh, of anybody from Adam all the way up. Who will live long? Pam had mentioned to me that he was. Um, he was one man who um, God took him before the flood, so he wouldn't because he didn't deserve punishment. I forgot about that. Well, I'm looking, trying to go back here and find the timeline. Methuselah did die before the flood. So did Noah's own father, who Noah, his father, lived to be. 777 years of age, Lamech. Enoch was taken, Methuselah died just before the flood. Interesting. Yeah, Lamech died just before the flood. So, Everyone that was an ancestor to Noah had all died before the flood. Wow. Uh, Methuselah lived a total of 969 years. Well, they raised a son that heeded God's word without question. And when I say without question, that might go with that he could have prayed and saved the world. Well, he didn't question. <laughs> he obeyed without question. They raised the one, you know, the one of his generation that would do that. Right. Save one man's soul, you save the world, right? Wow. Final words of the Parsha, but Noah found grace in the eyes of Hashem. That's Breshi. Yeah, six eight. The very last uh, of the of the the Parsha Bereshi. Um very last sentence. Right. He goes on how bad man is, and we get it from the, you know the start of six. And you know, anyway, the very last thing we read this week, or uh, yeah, this week would be, but Noah found grace in the eyes of Hashem. Wow. Yeah, see, it, it, it's even back here. Hashem said, I will blot out man whom I've created from the earth, from man to animal, creeping things, and birds of the sky, for I have reconsidered my having made them. But Noah found grace. Hmm. It's almost as if it just races right up to Noah, you know, in the beginning. 
right? We get the wonders of creation, this the miracle of 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 Gan Eden, um, the strife of men, building of cities, and the whole earth became sinful where evils man's evil could be seen in the earth and then it ends back up on one man so we've gone from one man to one man it takes all of it and then just right there boom and interestingly the next part noah talks about what all transpired at that point, but the last ending of Prophet Noah brings you right up to Abraham. So we go from Adam to Noah, Noah to Abraham, and, and just to um, Parshas. Wow. <laughs> How many balls? Thinking about all how old a lot of those live 900 years, 800, 700, whatever. And you just, you know, in two parshas, <laughs> or in one parsha, you right up to uh, what? Noah. Like somebody hit the fast forward button. Yeah. Yeah. The one thing that always amazed me was that all these people knew each other. And if you don't think about that, it's weird. And then it's like, wow, everybody knows one another. How do they do that? Well, yeah, they all live seven, eight hundred years. Hi. Yeah, eventually they're going to know one another. I never thought of that. Yeah, there would be a, a huge familiarity, wouldn't there? Yeah, several hundred years, it's overlapping generations. So, on one hand, you can say that Adam told the same story, if you will, creation story. He told it to his son, his grandson, his great grandson, his great great grandson, you know, and then by the time you've had that many generations, having learned the oral or written, maybe it was written, who knows? But Oh, we, we forget about the, 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 the proto man. Um, I think it was the I think it was Nachmanides who said there were 192 generations of humans. The Talmud talks about it. Rabbi Gav uh, Ga brought it up. He was uh, or brought, he, he, he was talking about it to us. They were, they were described as they look like us, but they were not us. They lacked something. And I'm thinking you've got Adam, who would have been a stranger amongst them. I'm not wanting to go that route, but it's already there. And <laughs> starts the Torah. And it starts the Parsha. At the end of this Parsha, we've got Noah. Let's, let's, um, Noah, he would have been a stranger in his own land. Even if everybody knows him, he's the only one building an ark and the only one even remotely interested. I mean, wow. And then we go to Avraham, who left, who became a stranger in his own world and left because of it. Not unlike how Noah had to leave that world behind. Now Adam had to for you know, had to had to toil in their world. His natural habitat was Eden. He had to toil in the land of these people, you know. Ooh, I just never thought I just I just never saw I never I never saw that. I never saw Noah the Gare. Noah the Stranger. I'm looking at the timeline again here of, of all the descendants of Adam. 
Adam was still alive at the time Noah's father was born. You think it was Adam who determined he would be the that his son would bring salvation? Not sure. Never really went down that road thinking that uh, that line of thought. But it's just powerful that you know Adam, Seth, Enoch, Kenan, Mahalo, Yared, Enoch, Methuselah, and Lamech were all alive. Same time. You know, we have this way of thinking today that, you know, maybe we're going to get three generations alive at the same time. This is eight, nine, nine generations all living at the same time. That blows our minds today. Yeah. And they keep having kids. That's 900 or 800 or whatever years worth of uh, procreation. <laughs> yeah. Welcome back, Hadassa. We're talking procreation. <laughs> Aren't you glad you showed up now? Oh, yeah. But I'm here to stay this time. Awesome. Yeah, I saw you, I saw you before you flipped your picture back. You were walking through dancing. I saw that. <laughs> Actually, I wasn't dancing. I was walking into Kroger. Oh, oh, okay. Well, I saw you. Were you happily walking into Kroger? <laughs> Who could dance with the Torah and not be happy? There you go. I mean. We're picturing the world in which our, our Parsha this week and there she brings us this um strange strange I mean humans were strange to us the way we are now. The, the physical makeup of the world, the fact that Rosalie brought up everybody knew everybody. You know, you're, you know, there was a common, there's a, a, a common familiarity. I'm sure, even after a few hundred years, you know your great grandpa and and this bunch of kids and that bunch of kids or whatever. They were all family. All right, I have to look this up. Okay. Ross pointed out that, you know, we start out with, with Adam and we end, but Noah found grace in the eyes of Hashem. We end with Noah. Noah is introduced. It's gone from one man to one man. A lot happens between the two, the, between these two um, in, in the text itself. And then we get Abraham at the end here. Um, well, I'm if, just they curious. Have, if they What's have to turn around and have a lot of sex going on, <laughs> it takes a lot of people to do that. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Yeah, it's a pretty big place to cultivate. That's why a lot of your farmers back in the day had big families because it took a lot of people to run a farm. Try the whole world. Yeah. We end with Ishmael on the next Parsha. So Adam to Noah to Abraham to Ishmael. I'm just going to keep doing this until I get bored. Of, and then we go into Vaikra. You 
the he get we get the coming of Isaac. And when at when Abraham stayed at, at uh, Beersheba. This is interesting. You remember that you asked me earlier about seven new lambs and fecal or fecal or fecal or Abimelech all at of the, the, well, at the well right? at the well right I I found or at least I know what the definition of fecal or fecal however you want to pronounce his name I know what that uh, suggests you were, you were you remember the discussion we had, right? A week or two ago about Beersheba. Yeah, making him a shepherd, taking him to the well, the well of seven. Well, fecal or fecal translates to the mouth of all. Fecal. What's it called again? Say, say it again, please. Fecal, Fecal, the right. guy that was at the well. Right. That relates to P, P, however, he, it's the, just mouth, coal, all, the mouth of all people, Fecal. Made him a shepherd. <laughs> Start tying all those little details together. You see the big That's amazing. I'm going to be doing a little bit of study. We got a half Torah. Hmm. Yeah, jump in it. Isaiah, yay. What am I missing? I got two. Hang on. Page 1372 in the Newton. Get there. Hang on. See, I had here, I go, I go to the Kabad website. Mm -hmm. Uh, it gives the half Torah, I think, for um, the holiday. But let's go with Isaiah. 13. 72. All right. Because they are 42.5 through 43.10. Oh, now you're giving me too many numbers. 13. 72. 72. Okay. You're confusing me. I was born kind of blonde. Ah. Strawberry blonde. The Haftoras. Here we go. And it's in Hebrew. The English part. All right. If you're reading along at home, we're going to be reading Isaiah 42 5 through 43 10, as Rosalie pointed out, that my brain just didn't handle. This is a section of the Torah, or a section of the Hebrew Bible, that directly pertains to the Torah. It just happens to pertain to the Torah. This is just a little inkling of this uh, fractal, cyclical, uh, ongoing lesson that is Torah study. It's, it's awesome, but we'll get to reading. Let's get to it. We'll do my best. I'm sure I'm looking ahead. Okay, hunk of, hunk of a parsha. Here we go. Thus was said by the Almighty God, who created the heavens and stretched them out like a tent, who laid out the earth and made all types of vegetation grow from it, who gives a soul to the people upon it, 
and a spirit to the other creatures who walk upon it. I am God. What I have what I have said about you, Mashiach through the prophets, it is true and everlasting. I will hold your hand to help you overcome every obstacle that I guard you and give you the might to bring the covenant of the Torah to my people in order to enlighten the eyes of the nations about God. <sighs> to open up uh, that, that, that crowd sound was not the Torah. Uh, <clears throat> to open eyes that have blinded themselves not to see the work of God, to release the Jewish people who are prisoners from their captivity and those who dwell in darkness from their imprisonment. I am God. That is my name. I will no longer allow the nations to diminish my honor by worshiping other gods as they have done until now. No longer will graven images be given my praise. The first prophecies which I prophesied about Sensharev have already occurred. I will tell you new ones about the final redemption. I will now let you hear what is, a, what is going to happen before these events unfold. When the final redemption comes, they will sing a new song to God and pray, and his praise will be heard from the ends of the earth. Those who navigate the seas and the creatures that live, live in it will praise God. Even the islands, them by the people of Kedar, will raise their voices in song. Those who live on stone peaks will sing shouts of joy will sing uh, will sing of sh will sing shouts of joy will be heard from the mountain tops with their mouths they will ascribe glory to god and they will tell of his praises in the islands god will go out to rescue the jewish people aroused with zeal for his people like a man of war he will he will shout and cry out against his enemies and he will overcome them says God, I have kept quiet for all this time that the nations have persecuted my people. I have been silent and I have restrained myself. But now I will scream like a woman in childbirth to destroy them. I will obliterate them and swallow them up altogether. I will destroy mountains and valleys and I will dry out all their grass. I will make rivers into dry and desolate islands and I will dry up their bodies of water. <clears throat> 16. I will, I will walk the Jewish people to their land on a way that they did not know, as if they were blind. I will lead them to a path they did not know. I will return the darkness of an unknown path into the light before them. I will make crooked paths straight for them. I have already done such things previously when they came out of Egypt, so I will surely not forsake them in the future. Then those who trust in graven images will turn backwards, being embarrassed, with great shame. They will be the fate of those who say to the nation, who say to the molten idols, you are our God, you, O Israel. Who are deaf towards my words and blind towards my commandments now listen and look to see the goodness that is awaiting you i call all of you blind even the righteous ones who serve me or who is really blind if not one who serves me and who knows how corrupt people are yet he does not attempt to correct them who is deaf if not the one who I grace wisdom, who I gra who I grace with wisdom, and sent to teach the people, and yet he pretends not to hear their evil actions, failing to correct them. Who is a blind person? No, who, who is as blind as a person who is perfect in himself but does not reprimand others? Who is as blind as a servant of God who turns a blind eye to his people? Such people have seen much wisdom, yet you do not 
you do not guard others from evils from evil ways so they deserve to be called blind they have open ears to understand the mitzvot yet they act as if they do not hear when it comes to guarding when it comes to guiding others so they deserve to be called deaf the main reason why god wants such people is not for their own merits but in order for them to make another person righteous and in order for them to increase and strengthen the torah knowledge of others that's where the uh ashkenazim communities or the uh, sephardim communities include the ashkenazic communities continue <laughs> This people is looted and trampled. All their young men are directed and hidden in prisons. They are prey with no one to rescue them from being looted, trampled with no one to say, return them so I will be trampled no more. Who among you will pay attention to this? Listen and hear from now on what will establish him in the end. Who landed Yaakov over to be triumphed in Israel to looters? Was it not God against whom they have sinned? For the Jewish people did not desire his ways or obey his Torah. So he poured out his anger, his wrath and the might of war upon them. It blazed around them and they had no attention to the fact that it was cursed by God and even after. It burned them and they did not take it to heart as divine intervention. But despite all this, God who created you, O Yekov, and formed you, O Israel, nevertheless says... Do not fear, for I have, for I redeemed you from Egypt, and I called you my own. When you pass through water and and nearly drown, I am with you. Even powerful rivers will not sweep you away. When you walk through the inferno of this life's difficulties, you will not be burnt, and the flame will not consume you. For I am God, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Did not I make Israel and you ran, Egypt you? Did I not make Egypt your ransom and save you even though you did not deserve it? Did I not send, or didn't I send Ethiopia to Saba to be destroyed by Sancherib instead of you? Because you are precious to me and honor. I love you. So I will give men in exchange for you and nations to be destroyed in your place. Do not fear, for I am with you. I will bring your children from the east and gather you from the west. I will say to the north, give me the Jewish people who are scattered there. And to the south, don't hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. All the Jewish people who bear my name, who were made for my glory. I have already created, fashioned, and made all that is necessary for their redemption in order to free the exiled people who are blind, though they have eyes, and deaf, though they have ears. Even if all the nations gathered together and all the peoples assembled, who among them could declare future events like this or announce to us that they had been predicted past, who had been predicted past events? If so, let them produce their witnesses and be proven correct, such that those who hear them will say that it is true. You are my witness, says God, my servant who I am who have chosen, that you may know and believe in me. And I understand that I am he before whom God has created and after whom none will exist. Thus ends the complete Barsha. Or half Yay! And they're talking to us! It's kind of nice, isn't it? Yes, yes, yes. Of course, as if it make me want to dance. Well, oh, get up. You got the book in your hand. Get up and do it.
It's self-preservation. That's why you want to attach to Israel. <laughs> Be a little selfish, folks. It's good for you. The right kind of selfish, right? Correct. Gee, I could be I could be wiped out over here, or I could be saved and live a good life here. Hmm. Gee, let me think. There's a Noahide fellow. He was writing that you know, folks who, if you will, go gare, are forsaking their own people, and that really, I think, pretty much sums up the great divide amongst the Bene Noach Noahide community is. Uh, is just that right there where one Noahide Ben Noah would would um, would submit to Israel in many ways and then another who would say that submitting to Israel is turning your back on the nations or your own people your own country your own communities Wow and it yeah it really it really blew me away but that really tells the difference that's why so many folks out there, including myself, see it is necessary to have an example taught of the Noahide God-fearer. Just brought to mind something, though. What's That's that? why the the, uh, the scouts that went out to scout Israel and came back and seven had a bad report and three didn't. Right. That's what that just reminded me of what you just said. Wow. There's some people who are no Cree and some who are not. Even the no Cree is welcome. Read Isaiah 56. Never let a no Cree feel that he can't come offer to God. This is after converts are no more. Never let a no Cree fear. Don't don't let him feel left out. Ever let no no you know. Mm -hmm. So I'm not. It's not. It's not an insult. But there are two different kinds of of Noahides out there. There really are. I mean, that's that's proof positive right there. And his philosophy is shared by a few out there. Not a lot, but a, a good number. Um, yeah. That we. And I would think, you know, when you attach to Torah, when you attach to God, you know, the world's covered. <laughs> I know it sounds selfish, but you're, you're, you, you will, you know, I think you will develop and the world will develop because of you. I don't think I'm turning my back on my people. Certainly not my country, not my family. And yet, at the same time, I did have to turn my back. You know, there's a little bit of pity going on about me, the black sheep. I didn't go full-blown atheist or nothing, but I'm I'm so devout, not unchristian. There is a bit of that. I agree. You know, there's a line drawn there, and, and it's noticeable. I kind of did turn my back on my people, and I did kind of attach to Israel in the process. Self-preservation. A little bit. A little bit. You know? Is that so bad? <laughs> well, don't, because God said love your neighbor as yourself. And if you're starting to learn to love yourself, you'll be able to love others. Very well put. Yes. <clears throat> yes. Just I got the user's manual for human consciousness, y'all. Thank God for the Jewish people. Amen. Now we haven't really talked much about it. When I when I think of, of keeping a grudge. I think of Esau and Jacob. Or, um, yeah. Or no, it was, uh, Isaac. 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 Right. Is, is, can you, could, can you get, I mean, it's almost like you can, you can consider what the Torah is teaching then as a grudge match. You know, when it started at birth. Yeah, pre-birth. Yeah. A 
you know, my, you know, I, I've got a soft spot for Ishmael. You know, it was they. You know, when people say they're the enemy, um, I, yeah. When the lines draw in the sand, I know where I stand. Um, I okay, I get that. If one's, but I, I almost posted it too. I almost posted this particular group on Facebook. I was about to say, but are they an enemy? And that might have started a whole bunch of, you know. That might have started with that might have started a real wrong conversation. So I didn't I didn't post it, but yay. <clears throat> I'm I'm I. You know, we in the West get a lot of news from around the world. We have people here who live well with others, and um, of all kinds, Muslim, Christians, Jewish people. Frank talks about a, a rabbi who will come and actually pray with them at the Sufi yeah. uh, I don't know, congregation. Yeah. And I can't get the I can't get the picture out of my head of them weeping over their father's death. You know, when they held on to each other's necks and wept. And I I hope that one day, I really, really do hope, and I know it might put me on the far out ends of everything, but that's what I see. I want to see that happen. In the right place. Huh? That is the right place to be. Mm -hmm. Reconciliation, redemption, unity. It's, there's a whole story. And it's, the Torah is for all nations. And those that rejected it will come back to it. That's the whole point, part of what was just read in Isaiah. Everybody that had been in idolatry will turn away from it. Everybody. And there will be no other. And the Torah will be for the whole world. The nations will, what does it say, be embarrassed? Um. Wow, just think about it. About six billion people instantaneously getting to know what maybe 25 million people know. <laughs> maybe. If that's, if that's not a heart attack in the making, I don't know what is. <laughs> Wow. But that's world peace overnight if that happens. Yep. Nothing to fight over. We'll be too busy chewing on that. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't doubt there be generations who just uh, where the world's just chewing on what's happened. You know, mulling it over and getting used to it. It'll take time, granted, but. Even still, it's like, you know, all the Christians and all the Muslims just all of a sudden, well, really? Wow. What the hell? You know? Wow. I was on the right path, but I was on the wrong path. Whoa. <laughs> yeah, I know. Instantaneously, you know, it's like, yeah. But that's the perspective if it were to happen today. You've got like, what, 25 million Jews? And but 2.5 billion Christians and 2 point something billion Muslims. And it's like, oops. I remember where I was when I came to that revelation. Um, when my jaw dropped, it was, uh, I just got my first book on Judaism. And I was at my friend James's. I remember looking out the window and it all just sank in. It, it happened in, a, in an hour. Everything fell into place at that one particular point. And, I'm, and I've got, you know, family was right. There is a God, but boy, do we have it all wrong. <laughs> I was, oh. <laughs> you know, there was that, I was on the right, but there was nothing like, you know. It's like a guy on the radio. 
I've gotten that before because I've been in radio. You know, they hear your voice for, you know, every day while they're driving or whatever, you know, and then they meet you and, wow, I didn't think, okay, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's the same thing being a telephone <laughs> operator. Yep. <laughs> wow, you don't look anything like your voice sounds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I used to get that when I was a telephone operator, too. They look at you for a second. Yeah, close your eyes. Now listen to the phone, okay? Now does it make sense? Now do you know who I am? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> now here's the, I will walk the Jewish people. This is, and I'm reading from the, the, the Gutnik. And they, they parenthesize things. One day I'm going to see you with another commission and compare, but it said, I, I will walk the Jewish people to their land on a way they did not know, as if they were blind. I will lead them on a path they did not know. He repeats that. A dark path. I will turn the darkness of an unknown path into light before them. So it, that's, you know, that's so reassuring. I think that when I tell that to people, they're, uh, very surprised that even Judaism will change. You know, yeah. it won't be like this. There's there's something else. They know it. You know, the, the difference is the Jews are like, please. <laughs> Yesterday, please. We're cramming for finals, too. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> I can see it changing. I don't know how exactly because I don't know enough of the details about Judaism, but I know that some of the rabbinics will fall away. And I think you've heard or somebody said the term, and I'm not sure where it originated from, but it's called Torah Judaism. Mm -hmm. I've heard that. I didn't hear. What did you say, Ross? Torah Judaism. How's it spelled? No, Torah. Torah. Oh, Torah. Okay. Torah, Torah Judaism. It's the, you know. Okay. It must be that Texas accent. Get some everything. Now it's enunciation and I'm going deaf, so hey, it's me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, anyway, uh, apparently there's a difference between Torah Judaism and rabbinic judaism and how much of it is rabbinic i'm not i couldn't tell you for sure but i do know that it it from what i can understand in torah and what i see with my eyes there will be changes like the karaites kind of maybe how do you aren't mean? They, aren't they the ones that just believe in the written Torah and not the oral Torah? Right. That that'll change. Right. I think Clarfing really is on to something when he said, you know, the priests, you know, the rabbis never did have total Torah authority. The authorities were always the Levites, the the, the Kohen. Right. Uh, and I think that's where we're headed. I think that's why I think that's what people are starved for in religion in the world. They're starved for the spirituality. I hate using that word. It's just, it's no, no, you're correct. But there, we're st we don't have that. We've been given enough to keep us going, and we've done our best. We've learned to read. Our peasants read. And the women read, and we do our best. I'm not, you know, but we are starved for that priestly presence, um, an effective one. And I think that's where Judaism's going. We, the rabbis, have saved us. They're still saving us. They'll always yeah. save us. But they're the only spark of they're the only spark of God that we have left. They've been the shepherds, but now I think is yeah. the, the return of the priest. Um, and maybe that's why people are scared of this gear bit, because I and I've, I heard this from a religious court judge, Rabbi Dove said when I asked him, I said if. You know, an outsider takes refuge in Israel. And, of course, at this point, why would you take refuge when you have world peace, yada, yada? But I was asking, if a non-Jew takes, you know, refuge in Israel, does he go to one of the cities? 
And he said, yes, that's where he would go. And yes, the Levites are the ones who run those. Yes. I go right back to what I was saying last year. Mm -hmm. Levi, Levi, attached. Uh -huh. Any, anything, any time, any word that ha ends in e. Um, Hiti, Levi, it, Ahi, mine. That's my brother. Ahi, my brother. Ami, my people. And when you look at Levi or Levi, what we say, Levi, Levi. Levi is what they say. Levi. Levi. My heart. Lev is heart. And then you look when he was born. Now my husband will attach himself to me. Therefore, she named him Levi. And. The Levites run the cities. He include they're even found in the cities of refuge, but each they maintain a presence amongst all the tribes. It's where you're going to find the Torah teachers. I've said all this from the beginning. The Levites will take it back. Yeah. Well, they have to because they are not. Their portion is of God. They are the spiritual ones. And they're supposed to be like the, not the ultimate light, but that's the best way I can put it right now. And well, because they didn't have, they didn't have an inheritance in the properties. Right. God is their inheritance. Exactly. The, um, and this is, um, you know, and it might sound self-serving to those who might be watching this, but um, the the Ben Noach, the I've even heard it said Goyim, who studies Torah, is like a high priest. Um, you know, and who else doesn't have a stake in the land? <laughs> the foreigner, the stranger. Yeah. They have no and stake in the land. They have no, you know, you're you're ordered to give them a portion, like you are the. So I guess the, the outsider comes with the priest. Ooh. Ooh. We learn to usher in the stranger. We learn to usher in the priesthood. Ooh. Ooh. See, I've always thought this gear bit is as much for Israel as it is for, for the for the nations. Ooh. I had, I had a really cool thought last week, and I was meaning to share it with you. If God said that the Jews are the light to the nations, they are the light and they throw no reflection. Well, God is the ultimate light. So he lights the candle. And the light itself is the Jew, but we're the candle. <laughs> I, thought, I thought about that for a good we, couple yeah, of days. And I, was, I wanted to throw that at you and see what you thought. The Hanukkah menorah, all the lamps are lit by a special candle. Mm -hmm. It stays lit beside them. It's lit first. And you put it yeah. in your window or your door, your, 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 you know, or in your door. Right, to be seen. To, for, yeah, to, to enlighten the world. Wow. Menorah has seven lamps. Mm-hmm. Mm hmm. Door of fire by night. Yep. But that just got me. It's like we're the candle. Love it. They're the light. And God lit them. We're meaningless. We're, we're the candle. It cannot be lit without us. They need us. And so their light can continue to shine. Uh, what is a good man but a bad man's example? What is a bad man but a good man's job? <laughs> oh. 
Well, it's it's not that late, but I do have to get up. I've got to take somebody to daycare in the morning. Mm. Oh. All right. Yeah. Little, little scoop. Don't wait for nobody, I'll tell you what. I'm, what I'd love to be four years old again. Oh, I don't think I could ever do that again. It's too hard the first time around. Uh, just for a day, maybe. You must have loved puberty. <laughs> Stop. Uh, That's pre-puberty, man. I'm kidding. Yeah. Well, do a little Scottish jig with your little, with your Torah there for a second, and that way you fulfilled that mitzvah. How's that? Oh, yeah, you go, there you go. Even better. I already did that little jig. That was that moment of silence. I stepped away. All right. There you go. I might do an Indian dance with mine. There you go. <laughs> All right. Love you guys. Good night. Good night. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. And, you know, we'll wrap up the live portion here. I think that's a, a good uh, a good place to end it. Join the Nova Nexus Google Plus page on Google Plus and the Nova Nexus Facebook page as well if you want to get details on how you can join in the conversation. On behalf of Ross, Karasa, and Rosalie and myself, uh, let me get this proper here. Shabbat shalom, y'all. Be well. Shalom, y'all.